Okay, uh, it's time. It's 3 p.m. So welcome everyone to our last webinar of the research and winemaking series that we did since August. And today we're going to talk about bottling and closures with two great presenters for our last webinar. Uh, Katie Cook from Scott Laboratories and um, Andrew Waterhouse from UC Davis. And so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Ogwatrolo. I'm um, an assistant professor of enology at Iowa State University in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. And I'm organizing and co-hosting this webinar with Mr. Drew Horton from the University of Minnesota. Great breeding and energy project. He's a research specialist of energy there. And so before we start our webinar, as always, I'm going to give you some instruction. Uh, so the webinar is being recorded mostly for our own purposes, but if you really need to have access to the recording, uh, just send me an email or send an email to Drew and we will create a folder where you will have access as a previewer. Uh, then for all your questions you will have during the presentation, um, you can type them either using the Q&A box or the chat box that you should have at the bottom of your screen or on the right side of your screen. If you don't see them, just go on the three dots at the bottom of your screen and you should have one of them appearing. Uh, and so all the questions will be answered at the end. Uh, also, at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email with a link for a survey that should take only two to five minutes maximum to complete the survey. So please just give us your feedback uh, to improve our webinar. So now, just a little bit of the organization of the webinar. So we will start by the presentation from Ms. Katie Cook from Scott Laboratories. Uh, she will talk about the practical aspect uh, for 30 minutes uh, of bottling and closures. And then that will be followed by Professor Andrew Waterhouse from UC Davis, who will present more the research aspect of bottling and closures. And then we'll finish by 30 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, so I will just leave Drew introducing Katie Cook. Uh, thank you first to Katie and Andrew and Chris for being uh, part of this webinar. Thank you, guys. All righty. Can you hear me, Ode? Yes, I can. All right. Well, once again, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce Katie Cook from Scott Labs, our first presenter. Uh, Katie has a, a wealth of winemaking uh, education and experience, uh, and a lot of that in cold hardy varieties. Uh, she has a BS in biology from the University of Houston and a master's degree in enology from the University of Burgundy in France. And I, I, I'm sure they don't just give those degrees away willy nilly there in France. <laughs> anyway, prior to joining Scott Labs, uh, she was the Enology Project Leader at the University of Minnesota. Uh, most recently, the Assistant Winemaker at Herman J. Weimer Vineyards uh, up in the Finger Lakes. And when she's not uh, cooking and decorating her home and talking wine with her clients, uh, Katie enjoys gardening, spending time with her husband and daughter and dog. <laughs> there you yeah. go, Katie. And I also wanted to just mention here, you see Chris's picture and he's on here too. So. Chris uh, Holman is our GM of packaging at Scott Labs, and he was originally, he had some prior commitments, so it was uncertain if he could join us, but he's also joining in today, so I'm really glad to have him for Q&A. Chris has had a kind of more impressive background when it comes to production experience and working on really large bottling lines and managing bottling, so it has some really um, good background on that for question and answers. Um, so this, we're just basically focusing on really basic information. I think coming, um, you know, working for Scott Labs, you see a lot of the issues that come up for a lot of wineries when they're purchasing corks and when they're looking at screw caps. And so this is supposed to be kind of an overview to give you an idea of what to look for when you're 
purchasing and when you're bottling to make sure that you don't run into issues. Um, so lots and lots of options nowadays for that you can use for packaging still wine. Um, we're not going to go into sparkling wine just because that's a whole other animal, um, but cork, there's technical corks, uh, screw cap, and um, synthetic corks, and then some people even will use crown caps on still wine. Uh, we're going to focus most of this on cork um, and touch a little bit on screw caps. Um, cork and uh, the, techni the technical cork, these microglomerate corks, um, and not so much about the other things. There's also plenty of other alternative closures on the market if you're looking into those. Um, vino seal, vino lock, those are the glass ampules that a few people use. I have people using Zork, bar top. Um, all of these um, come with the with different expenses for setup <laughs> with all of them, um, and they're in different bottle types. So if you're getting into those, then that's a whole different ball game. Um, so we'll stick with the easy stuff with natural cork. All right. I don't know why this isn't advancing. Oh. See, hopefully it doesn't do too many pages. All right. So if you didn't know, natural cork harvested from cork trees. Um, big interest nowadays that I wanted to mention is that this is actually a, a carbon negative. Um, option. So for wineries that are looking um, to reduce their carbon output uh, because they're, it's harvested sustainably, um, it's a good option for that. It's been around as long as wine has been around, so it's a pretty reliable closure. Um, but it is subject to some vintage to vintage variation and tree to tree variation. So it is a natural product, um, which needs to come with some precautions as well. One of the main issues that people have always brought up with cork is this issue of cork taint. It's the smell, like that wet dog smell or damp basement. Um, I'm talking about corked wine. Uh, I know when I was working at the University of Minnesota, so I was there in 2010, and a lot of the recent research was still showing, you know, five to seven percent cork taint from like 2005. But from 2010 on, and especially in the last five years, there's really been huge leaps made in the cork industry to kind of eliminate, eradicate TCA, um, that cork tain in wine. And um, the newest thing that you'll hear about more on the market is this dry steam method that's that's just coming out. Um, and so it's less of an issue now than it has been, but because it's been an issue, that's where a lot of these alternative closures have come in into the marketplace and taken over for cork, um, but still a great closure. And I did want to mention for um, TCA that there are other sources of TCA for your winery besides cork. Um, so barrels can be a source of TCA, wooden pallets, uh, sometimes old buildings with wood beams, especially if they were treated with a chlorine product, you can that can be a source of TCA. So you can really have low levels of TCA present near wine, where maybe you don't generally pick up on it, um, but it's masking fruit, uh, fruit muting fruit. Um, and in general, we say that the detection threshold for TCA is about six parts per trillion which is really tiny, like one drop in 500,000 barrels. Um, so if you have one part per trillion in a cork and five parts per trillion in coming from your wine or from winery born, it can cause some issues uh, where you can start detecting it. But it's just something to be aware of in your winery and there's ETS labs can test for it. You can get um, kits to test for airborne TCA in the winery as well, if it's something you're thinking about. Um, there are also other off aromas or um, things, things that can that cork can taste like. Uh, so, you know, it being a natural product, you can get these um, smoky coffee aromas, earthy beetroot, um, mushroom. And so uh, Chris can talk a little bit more about this, but the you know, when we send out samples, when you get sample requests for cork, it's always a good idea to do a soak um, test through. It shouldn't be an issue if you're getting from a reputable supplier. You shouldn't have any of these off characters. 
um, but it's something to be aware of. And so when you go to purchase a uh, natural cork from your supplier, the first thing they're going to talk about is grade with you, what kind of grade of cork you want. And I often get the question, people get confused between the grade of cork being quality related to taint. And grade is just essentially a visual grade of the cork. So you can see kind of the cork on the top here would be a really high kind of almost perfect cork where there's very little visual imperfections on the cork. Um, going down to you know the bottom grade where there's some more imperfections on the cork. Uh, this it's it's really comes down to a price point. <laughs> With the when you're talking about grades of cork, um, the higher grades of cork are more uniform lot. If you're doing, um, if you have a hundred dollar bottle of wine, putting a lower grade cork might not be um, great aesthetically for your packaging as well. Um, I don't know, Chris, you were mentioning that now we even have the X-ray technology, so wormholes aren't even an issue in cork. I don't know if you want to talk a little about the yeah, just real, yeah real quickly like in, in the past we what we in the cork industry noted was critical defects of corks and that was typically wormholes or dry years and uh, now we have x-ray technology that actually x-rays the cork and we can actually see if there is a wormhole in it through a density and uh, we can reject those corks so really a, a what critical defects, you know, 10, 15 years ago would create leakers or, or uh, issues for you in the volley line uh, really no longer exist. Uh, critical defects are a thing of the past as, as well as really TCA. When you talk about TCA, the dry steam technology, um, we have a two-step process and uh, just introduced this this last year. And um, I've been in the industry 30 years and in the last five years, like Katie, four or five years, we've really made strides towards removing and eradicating TCA. And uh, now we're seeing, you know, less than 1%, whereas like Katie said, you know, we, you could see six to 7% uh, back in the day, uh, which obviously opened up the door for these other closures to come into the market and take part of the market from the court. But yeah, so critical defects are really, really honestly a thing of the past. And if we get a call from somebody that says they have leaking bottles uh, for us, it's, it's um, we can pretty much rule out a critical defect. It's usually a, a over compression, the cutting of the of the cork with the jaws, or uh, some other thing like pressure or vacuum, no vacuum. So run into a whole gamut of things. And so we, you know, being in the industry so long, we know exactly what to check uh, to determine that root cause. Yeah, and it's also just important to realize that every supplier has their own methodology for for their visual grade or their own scoring system. Um, so it's best just to compare Apple's app, just request samples and get and compare the grades to each other at a similar price point um, to see how they compare visually. Um, there might, there may be in the past when we talked about grades too, we used to talk a lot about the artwork can be affected, um, the printing quality on the surface when you're using an ink, um, just because the ink can't get into the holes. But now with newer laser printing, um, it doesn't affect it at all. So it's 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 really visual crop quality. We do talk about um, the higher grades being more uniform. If you think of these as sponges, um, and I'll talk. Well, I'll mention this. I know Dr. Waterhouse will probably be talking a, a lot more <laughs> about um, some of the uh, oxygen transmission. Um, but briefly, when you talk about oxygen ingress with cork. Um, oxygen with cork is primarily through diffusion. So if you think of the cork like a big sponge, most of the oxygen is held up in the cell structure of the cork. So as you squeeze it and push it in the bottle, you're actually getting a really um, controlled diffusion of oxygen into the bottle over the first six to nine months of aging. So that first six to nine months is really critical for oxygen coming into after cork. And then after that, um, the it's really negligible and so that first the cell structure of the cork can change how much oxygen comes in in that first um, six to nine months but you know usually after that you're going to not see much difference bottle bottle variation and 
you know, Chris has mentioned before, and anyone who's worked on a bottling line, um, likely a lot of the differences that you're getting bottle to bottle variation is more from stopping and starting at the bottling line, kind of end of run bottling where you might get a little bit more oxygen through. Um, so it's probably less worrisome for that. And then just to note, when you're looking at um, artificial close closures, so screw cap, um, some of the plastic corks that are out there, those do allow some for some oxygen to pass directly through the closure from the outside air. And so, and that's kind of at a rate that's a little bit more standard. Um, and I included just this one graph because I think it's it's important to see if you look at that, the yellow bar is kind of how much oxygen comes through into the line from the first year of aging. And then kind of going from green to blue, it shows each additional year how much oxygen gets through. So I don't know, can you see a cursor when I move this on here or yep. no? No, okay. Yes, well, we can oh, see oh, yes. a little bit, yep. just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the natural cork in the middle, you can see kind of the first year you have a big impact. Um, so these are things to think about when you're, if it's a, a wine that's going to be aged, you know, one year, you might want something, you know, if it's something you're bottling in, Jan in yeah, January, releasing in April, maybe you want something that's a little bit tighter closure for it. Um, or think about the type of closure for it versus something that you want to age a little bit longer. Um, Depending on your wine as well, right, Katie? If it's a nice fruity wine and you want it to stay fruity, you know, and you want it to yeah, be from the bottle right. time to time you release it on the market. And that's the nice thing about the different closures that are out there is that based on a price point or how quickly your wine is turning in the market, there's many different choices, it's not just natural cork, there's other screw caps and and micros and other things that may fit your need and uh, your product better. Yep. Okay, so I wanted to point out, um, so when you people come into issue with cork, um, it's often because it's either stored incorrectly or, um, you know, maybe they're getting it from a reseller or someone where they don't know how it's been stored. Um, a, a really good resource is the Cork Quality Council website, if you find that. Um, you should be purchasing cork from someone who is a member of Cork Quality Council just because they have standards to maintain to make sure the, the integrity of your closure uh, for cork. Um, so as far as moisture levels of the cork, TCA testing, um, traceability, and all of that. So um, if you you know, purchase cork from a reputable supplier, you should be getting cork that's arriving with five to 7% moisture, should have a fresh silicone coating. Um, you should be able to bottle it without any issues. It'll be stored in a bag with um, with SO2 to prevent any other microbial issue issues from happening as well. Um, if you've received those and you've stored them in your warehouse for longer than six months, um, you may need to think about reprocessing because a lot of the issues that come with cork are just from either that silicone coating breaking down or just moisture loss with it. And the main issue that we tend to deal with is when people get leakers on their cork. So that's always um, calling and complaining about uh, a problem with the cork. And um, almost always, probably 99% of the time, it's caused from um, either overfilling, so you're not correct, not calculating your ullage correctly. Um, so you know, maybe the ullage calculation from your bottle drawing will be uh, assuming that you're filling at 68 degrees, between 68 and 70 degrees. Um, and if you fill it colder, then you need to recalculate your the height of your fill. Um, positive pressure in the bottle, so sometimes the vacuum on your fill doesn't work and um, the positive pressure causes um, wine to push up over time. Uh, corker jaw is not being properly maintained, so you can get some crimping on the cork, which allows for some wine seepage to come up. Um, and then lastly, just not, not verifying your bottle drawing, um, making sure that your glass is compatible with, with the length and the diameter of your cork. Um, so taper is a big issue on the glass, and I'll show a couple of bottle diagrams just to show that a little bit. So um, 
um, the very, we'll start from the right, because the right here shows kind of that ideal fill height. So the 66.68 would be the depth in millimeters or you know 2.6 inches um, would be where you wanted that ullage to be. And then this one's really nice because they're showing that the bottle doesn't have a taper down to 55 millimeters or down to about two inches. Um, so you could essentially put a two inch cork in here and not have any issues with tapering of the bottle um, and still have enough headspace for filling on this. So those are kind of things that you want to verify with your cork diagram. Um, the next one is showing a large format burgundy bottle. So this is a Magnum bottle. Um, one thing that uh, a misconception is on a lot of these large format bottles, um, people think they need a larger cork. And this is showing that the opening would fit a standard diameter cork. Um, and a lot of people also want to put a large length cork in these larger format bottle corks. And this one, if you actually look, they're showing where the taper, where the taper is kind of exceeding the cork diameter. Um, so at this depth, which if you add up these numbers is about 54 millimeters. So if you put a cork at 54 millimeters, you might start seeing some leakage seeping up here because you're not making a complete seal with that. And one thing that Chris always recommends, um, kind of an easy check for this, if you're unsure about if it's going to work, is you can take some coffee in the bottle and, and add your cork and then flip it upside down and hold it against a light. And you should be able to see if there's a complete seal at the bottom or if the coffee is starting to come up the sides on the, on the bottle a little bit. So that's a nice little trick um, to try for that. Um, if you go to the Cork Quality Council website, you can find bullet charts like this. Uh, this comes from our website. You can find it on our website as well. But just to be aware that you know, with these temperature differences, and I know Iowa, Minnesota, you have very cold cellars, and sometimes it's hard to maintain, it's hard to bring up the wine to temperature at bottling. Um, but this would, that 68 degrees is usually what bottle diagrams will tell you, um, will tell you what the fill level should be on the cork and what the ullage should be, so that headspace between the cork and the top of the wine. Uh, so you can see there's quite a big difference in headspace. Um, so that's 17 millimeters down to 23 millimeters with only a 10 degree difference in the wine. Um, so also it's important to um, always be checking the temperature of the wine as you're filling. Uh, the corker jaws, this four piece sliding jaw is kind of standard in the industry and what you wanna be using because um, it causes less crimping. And just follow your manufacturer's instructions for that. So maintain your lubrication schedule, um, Make sure that it's running smoothly, uh, that you have good alignment. Uh, one thing to be aware of with this is that we do have a target compression for natural cork being 15.5 millimeters of compression on this. And sometimes when you're using a synthetic cork, they require more or less pressure to get it in the bottle. So if you're switching between cork types, uh, that's something to be aware of with this so that you're not over compressing or under compressing different products. Yeah, always good to always good to confirm with your supplier what that compression is, but the standard is 15.5, but <clears throat> always good to ask. Yep. And then just mean doing some regular quality control during bottling. So, you know, it's always a good idea to pull a bottle every half hour or so while you're bottling. Um, check your internal bottle pressure so you can buy just a pressure gauge with a needle on it that you can pierce the cork with just to make sure that it's zero pressure or negative pressure um, in there. Uh, you can pull the corks out as well, verify that there's no crimping from the cork jaws, double check your temperature uh, regularly to make sure that you're filling and verify your fill height. Uh, and then also just make sure that you're keeping your bottles upright for five to 10 minutes post bottling so that you give them time to expand. Uh, another, another key thing just to add there, uh, a lot of people either have a single head corker or a four head corker. And so when you're checking vacuum, there's, there's really three critical things when you're bottling and that one is your fill height, your bottling temp, and make sure that you're pulling a vacuum. Um, zero is good. Minus three is kind of the sweet spot when you're pulling a vacuum. 
But going back to a forehead corker or a single head corker, if you have a forehead corker, it's it's great that you're testing one bottle to check and see if you're pulling vacuum. But you really should be checking all four because you have four heads and they all have to pull vacuum. So just because one pulls vacuum doesn't mean the other three are because you know whether it's cork dust or the va the vein pump vacuum pump gets hot and you lose vacuum. It's always critical to uh, to check that because if you don't pull vacuum, there's a good chance you're going to end up with real positive pressure in there, and that's going to create things like wicking, where you see wine seepage up to the bottom of the cork through the sides, as well as leaking, potential leaking. So you don't want to spend all that time making great wine, get it closed, and then have issues. I mean, this is the key point of you want to finish that pro product out well. So. Yeah, and I know we're going to get this question because I know in, in your neck of the, in the, <laughs> the Midwest, there's a lot of people that are still hand bottling or using um, Kind of semi-automatic bottlers that might not have a vacuum on it mm -hmm. and i always get the question um of how long people can leave their bottles upright for or what's the limit because people think they need to turn them upside down to be in contact with the line and um you know it's you should be fine you should take you know six months or so to let that pressure equalize inside the bottle before you flip them um, if you don't have access to a vacuum yeah, there used to be a, the old, the, the myth was if you left the bottles upside right, that they had to be flipped. And the reality is, is that there's enough moisture in that bottle that wicks to the cork that will keep the cork, the moisture in, in good shape. So the cork's not going to dry out. Yeah, Granted, so you're not screwing it at four pallets high in a warehouse that's, you know, 120 degrees up there. And then you're going to have issues with, with leakers and pressure. But you should, you know, normal bottle bottling situations where you're pulling a vacuum, your fill height's right, your temperature's right. Um, you should have no problem by the time it comes off the bottom line to be able to flip those uh, quickly because the cork will rebound at about 95% after it's been compressed. So um, I've bottled millions of cases of wine and and uh, and flipped them by the time they fill and get to the end of the line, they're, they're case packed and flipped and, and have never seen an issue. But we always recommend that you leave them upright under the proper bottling conditions, about five to 10 minutes. Um, but you, you can cheat a little bit if you need to. <laughs> yeah, there's the practical in the in the book, yeah. by the book yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so switching gears completely uh, from cork to screw cap. So this is gonna be a very, very quick overview because we have a few minutes left, and, and this is just a little plug for Scott Labs, but pointing out, um, we do have a great webinar on screw caps that is about an hour and a half long uh, that you can go to our website and find, and um, some really, really good information that goes in depth about screw caps and, and things to consider with it. And I just wanted to um, touch briefly on some of the screw cap misconceptions uh, with wine, that it's only for low value wine, that screw caps cause reduction um, and that all screw caps perform the same and are applied the same. So different manufacturers, they're going to be a little bit different um, and that consumers don't like screw caps. So the industry is changing pretty rapidly on this and you see screw caps on all kinds of wines. Um, so it's really just an option depending on what you want for your aesthetics and for your um, consumer market and, you know, talking about oxygen exposure and things like that. Uh, the one thing that you're that you will that you might want to consider with screw caps is your liner choice. Um, so most of the screw cap market, probably more than 90% of the market, uses a Saranex liner, um, and so that's the standard choice. If you want very little oxygen, the Saran tin is a good choice. So a lot of Australians actually use Saran tin. And then if you're using high pressure products or if you're doing any pasteurization or hot fill, you need a specialty liner for your screw caps. Uh, these are just some of the basic terminology once you start getting into it. So the top redraw is just your head pressure. Um, the bridge is where the screw cap breaks. The skirt is kind of the bottom. All of these, all of this terminology becomes a new language when you get into screw caps because you'll have to talk to um, the manufacturer and troubleshooting all of this to make sure your application is done correctly. Um, so standard recommendation would be to get a torque tester if you're going with screw caps and this just um, ensures that you're staying within the manufacturer recommendations 
or um, how tight the cap is. Uh, you know, you can check, you know, pull bottles periodically and check it just by um, opening it yourself and making sure that it's a nice seal. But ideally, you'll want the, these measurements, especially if you're doing a large volume, um, so you can track for QC um, to make sure yeah, that again, the that's integrity. Yeah. That's kind of the standard, right? And and you, know, you go back to like not not everybody can afford one of these because they are pretty expensive, but it definitely is insurance when you're using screw caps. And and if you can't afford one and you want to use screw caps, one one way to to check it is to make sure your torque when you're twisting the ball that it does the bridge brakes do snap. And if you spin the cap off and look on the inside at the liner, you can see the compression from the redraw. So if it's getting a nice solid impression in, in the screw cap into the liner, you know it's probably making a, a, a good enough seal for you to feel safe and sleep at night. So. Yeah. Um, here's some more, maybe more advanced QC that you can do when looking at screw caps. So again, looking at the internal bottle pressure um, to just because the screw caps don't handle um, a lot of head pressure. So you want to make sure that you don't have excessive head pressure in it. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Waterhouse will touch a little bit more on dissolved oxygen and free sulfur over the course of bottling, but this is just ensuring that you're not getting too much oxygen uptake. And then also periodically checking your wine temperature and verifying your fill height. Um, and then just to finish, here's showing the differences in headspace on a um, screw cap versus a cork finish. So that distance between the top of the wine and the cork, that ullage, um, it's much larger, so you have much more chance for um, getting some oxygen uptake at bottling with screw cap wines um, if you're bottling at the correct at the correct fill height on these. Um, so, like with cork with screw cap, you want to make sure that you are um, controlling that headspace at the bottling line. So either um, you know through uh, uh, nitrogen sparging. You know, vacuum is part of that, or a nitrogen drip uh, in, in that headspace just to, to control that. Um, so with that, I'll lead that into Dr. Waterhouse's presentation where he's talking about some different finishes. I know we have questions at the end, um, so we'll wait that, but that's just my contact information. If there's any questions for me, we have an inside sales team in the packaging department that's really technically sound as well that can answer any questions and help you work through any packaging as well. Um, Great. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you, Chris, for some precision. Uh, so please remember to type any of the questions you may have either in the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, so now I'm going to make Professor Wethouse presenter and I'm going to introduce him. Uh, so he is uh, one of my former supervisor when I was a postdoc at UC Davis. Uh, so I know a little bit of what he's doing. Uh, I'm still gonna read his introduction just to make sure I'm not messing up uh, this introduction. So Professor Andrew Waterhouse is the third generation Californian, but moved frequently while growing up, including some years abroad. He attended the University of Notre Dame, where he earned the Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, and then UC Berkeley for his PhD in Organic Chemistry. In 1991, he moved to the Department of Viticulture and Analogy at UC Davis, where his research program has delved into wine oxidation, as well as various aspects of wine chemistry, with an emphasis on phenolic compounds. His graduate students and postdocs are winemakers, researchers, and faculty across California and elsewhere around the globe. He is currently a co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Science of Food and Agriculture and is director of the Robert Mondavi Institute at UC Davis. So, Andy, I think you will be able to share. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's right. Yep. Thank you. All right. So, uh, let's see, can you wave if you can hear me? I just want to check. <laughs> All right, okay. Thank you, Ode. Um, so today I want to talk about a project we we actually did a few years ago, <clears throat> but I think it's still 
of interest um, for people who are concerned about closures. Um, we did this work with uh, actually Jillian Guernsey um, uh, did a lot of the work uh, in the in the project. So I'll talk a little bit about oxygen and wine preservation and history of bottles and closures. Um, and I, I appreciate uh, the, the Katie and Chris, they did a, a really good um, presentation of the practical issues. So I, I won't have to, I can skip over some of this stuff. Um, and I'll talk about our project itself. Um, so <clears throat> as wine ages, uh, you do get oxygen into the bottle and ultimately, um, while the oxygen is important, particularly for red wine in, in color and flavor development, at some point you end up with wine that is too oxidized. That's sort of the fate of all food products and wine eventually becomes oxidized. Um, and it's just for, I guess, just to put things in perspective, um, we haven't always had bottles. Um, in the very early days, Greek and Roman times, wine was uh, sealed, as it were, uh, in pottery containers, which didn't seal all that well. And really, uh, aged wine was not really, uh, it didn't really exist. I mean, there was wine a few years old, but 20 or 30 year old wines just didn't exist. But when we ended up with glass bottles, <clears throat> um, that gave us a hermetic container and we need a seal on it. And uh, cork was introduced in uh, 1700s. Um, and here's a funny story, the cork screw uh, was created in 1778. And uh, I, I, I don't know how they got the corks out before that. Um, and now we we pretty much have a standard glass bottle uh, with a, a cork in it as the sort of the most common wine container. Um, <clears throat> when you look at you know what happens to wine after it gets bottled, a few factors are very very important to consider. Uh, one of the most important is the type of wine. Um, some wines we actually want to develop in the bottle. Um, these are generally more expensive wines, red wines, some, a few white wines and a few special wines will also develop in bottle. Um, when bottling, uh, <clears throat> a key factor is, do you add SO2 or not? If so, how much? And so generally speaking, winemakers have a very clear idea of how much SO2 they want to add at bottling because it's the key uh, antioxidant that protect the wine. The next thing to consider is what you're going to close the bottle with, um, and I'll discuss this in much more detail, um, how much oxygen you want to come into the wine after it's been bottled. And then um, you should be uh, very well aware of how much oxygen is introduced during bottling, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, Katie mentioned how important that is. And then storage conditions and shipping, hopefully the wine, <laughs> we would all like our wine to remain at about 60 to 65 degrees until it's opened. But of course that doesn't really happen, um, especially if you're going through distribution. Um, so you have to be aware of what might happen to the bottle after it leaves your possession. So one really basic bit of chemistry here is that <clears throat> If you're using SO2, you're using it as a sink for any oxidation. And um, the reality is that SO2 doesn't react directly with oxygen, but it reacts with all the other stuff that the oxygen reacts with and ultimately uh, is the sink. And so it, it consumes in conceptual manner um, oxygen. And it does so at a one to two molar ratio, which turns out to be a one to four mass ratio. So if you have a certain amount of SO2 in your wine and you introduce one milligram per liter of oxygen, that will effectively break down and consume. It may take a few weeks or in some cases longer, 
uh, but it will break down as effectively four milligrams of SO2. And so when you bottle, if your procedure introduces a lot of oxygen, you probably should be adding extra SO2 up front to make sure that after the wine is bottled and all the oxygen is broken down, that uh, you still have some SO2 left in the wine. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a good bottling line um, will have less than one milligram per liter of oxygen in the wine after bottling. Um, if you're in the range of four to five milligrams per liter of oxygen, then you don't have very good control of your bottling procedure. Um, and as I indicate here, that will break down a tremendous quantity of the SO2 that you add before bottling. Okay. So, uh, Katie mentioned this. Um, there's uh, what, what are your options in the market? Uh, natural cork obviously is a traditional favorite. Um, synthetic corks, um, Noma cork really has that market in the US. And, and pretty much everywhere else, uh, they became fairly popular until a few years ago. And now the, the usage of synthetic corks is slowly declining. At least that's the last data I saw. Um, screw caps uh, continue to gain uh, popularity um, as well as technical corks. And I'll mention a few of them, a few different types of technical corks. Um, so we see that the market for closures is fairly dynamic. Uh, things are changing with time. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you have lots of options out there. Um, <clears throat> what are the key criteria for deciding what closure to use? Uh, the one I'm going to focus on today is how much oxygen goes through the closure. Um, this controls wine oxidation and SO2 depletion. Um, another issue is consistency, and I have data to specifically address that. Um, as Katie mentioned, natural cork is a natural product, so it's more variable, and I'll show you how much more variable that is. Other issues with closures have to do with um, uh, contamination or scalping. In other words, does the closure introduce something into the wine and, and TCA and cork? Natural with natural corks is a is a, a the, sort of the most common issue of contamination. Closures can also absorb materials, flavors, and aromas out of the wine. Um, there was a lot of concern with synthetic corks with this issue. In general, it's not that big a problem. It's not discussed that much. Um, but even natural cork absorbs some of the substances out of the wine. So there's a there's a little bit of back and forth. Some things come out of the closure, some things go into the closure. Um, but in general, it's not a serious problem. I mean, the only one, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is uh, corked wine. Um, another issue is how long does the closure remain a seal, a good seal? And generally speaking, we're talking about decades here. Um, and with some of the Manufactured closures, there's the manufacturer will tell you how long they expect the closure to last. Um, and then the last issue that I've heard about is really uh, removal. In other words, getting the cork out of the bottle or getting the closure off. Um, you know, how hard or how easy that is. And in the early days, synthetics had real severe, severe problems, but all those have been pretty much resolved. And but these are this is I think this is an important list of, of factors that you should have in, in mind. These are the things that define the performance of the closure. So natural cork um, <clears throat> insertion, I said insertion is low tech. Uh, Katie spent a lot of time talking about the issues you can have with that, but on a relative scale, putting corks in is simple. It's been people have been doing it for a couple hundred years. Um, the amount of oxygen that gets through a cork um, is about, uh, I put here a microgram per day, it turns out to be about a milligram per year in the early years, and that changes with time. Um, generally, they last a few decades. 
Um, I've seen natural cork in bottles that are 50 years old, but generally those have problems. So if you have, if you're going to keep wine for a very extended period, you probably should have a recorking program. Um, and as, as mentioned earlier, cork tank was a big problem earlier and it's pretty much, it's, I won't say it's completely gone, but um, between different processing techniques and uh, individual cork testing, um, you can pretty much get rid of this problem, although it's expensive to, to buy corks that have been individually tested. So that's an option is to look at uh, closures that have been individually tested and removed. I mean, in other words, the, the manufacturer removes any tainted corks from the production. Um, uh, I'm not gonna, I'll skip over this. Um, Synthetic corks are produced by extrusion made with low density polyethylene. You can define now what OTR you want. Um, and these are a drop in substitute for natural cork. So that, that's one of the reasons that they're easily adopted is that um, if in the early days, in particular, if you wanted to avoid TCA, this was, this was the only option you had. Um, and so it's a drop in replacement for a natural cork. Um, screw caps. Um, uh, again, Katie mentioned some of the, the, uh, the, the, the standard liners. Um, these, however, not drop in replacement, obviously. You have to have completely different technology. And I would recommend that you, if you're going to consider uh, screw caps and you haven't already, uh, you carefully consider how, how much uh, more technology you're going to need to apply it properly. Uh, watch that video. Um, it's a, it's much more complex and uh, putting them on properly is technically much more demanding. Um, one thing that uh, Katie didn't mention is that the company in, in, in California called G3 has a, a, a bottle called a robo bottle. You can actually put it through the bottling line and it measures all kinds of stuff about the application pressure and the, all that stuff. So there's actually a way to test whether your, your screw cap system is working properly. Um, it, I'm sure it's relatively, I'm sure it's fairly expensive and so on, but there is a way to actually measure all this stuff in real time um, that, that's important to know to make sure that the uh, screw caps are being put on properly. Um, <clears throat> also, I think you've already heard about these liners. Uh, this the Saran tin is, is, is extremely low um, oxygen transfer rate. And I've seen these used in wines and, and, and effectively you get a different product after aging. So, so it's, it's really um, almost, uh, the, the wine is being bottled with virtually no oxygen. So if you're gonna use this tin liner, you have to realize that in 10 years, the wine will be completely different from wine sealed under natural cork. Um, so it's a it, it, it's an interesting option, but you should should be aware of that. It, it, um, and I also mentioned there's there's now uh, people that sell companies that sell the the liners. You can decide you know, how much oxygen you want to get through the liner, and and that affects of course the development of the wine during aging. Okay, and technical corks. Um, these are, um, at least in Europe, you'll see very small and uh, corks made just these particles. Um, it's what you find on the one euro bottles. Um, those are not particularly good closures. <laughs> um, and we have the twin top types with a little bit of natural cork on the ends. And I think the important point is that if you're making these, you can by using certain technologies like Dion, uh, remove the TCA, and so one of the reasons that uh, these uh, uh, closures are very popular is that they're essentially TCA free and, and look like natural cork and perform in many ways like a natural cork, except they're a little bit more consistent. There's a little diagram here. You actually grind up, the way this is done is you grind up all the cork and you process it with carbon dioxide to strip out any TCA, and then you assemble the cork from that. Uh, it's an interesting process, um, and as I mentioned, these are fairly popular in the market, uh, from what I can tell. So, uh, how much oxygen gets through the closure? This is a, a list of uh, data from a number of 
the many different reports. Um, some of these are, are probably not actually uh, of use. Um, there's some of these uh, scary numbers about really high and highly variable natural cork transfer rates were really uh, from closures that were dry. They hadn't even been in a, a bottle with wine. Um, but you can see, I mean, if we exclude a few of these, um, you know, the amount of oxygen that comes in varies uh, from you know, less than one milligram per liter, per, one milligram per year to a few milligrams per year. And so, you know, the, the we, we do have a range, you have a range of, of choices here and how much oxygen you want the wine to be exposed to during aging. Uh, variability, I'll be showing you some data on this, it shows there's uh, various amounts of variability. Certainly with the manufactured closures, the screw cap in particular, it has to do with the variability of the application. So, um, whereas with the synthetic and natural cork, it's really based on, probably based on the, uh, Closure itself. So <clears throat> there's a, a very important study that came out of Australia some years ago. They looked at how wines developed. This this was they they used a semi on wine, and you could see that over time the uh, with the high oxygen transfer rate closures, the wines really developed very differently. At the time, it was really great, I mean, exciting information. And now I think we all pretty much assume that closures help define the wine as it ages. Um, so we did a project trying to look at the variability of these closures, and we looked at natural cork, synthetic, and screw cap. We put these on in a, in a commercial bottling line. Um, and so it was, it was a, a, I would say, a reputable um, a mobile bottling line uh, service that did this, uh, set this up for us. Um, and then what we did was we measured the amount of oxygen that came into the bottle by measuring the browning of the wine. So we put the, the wine into clear glass bottles <clears throat> and we measured the darkness of every single bottle periodically. And we looked at how the color of the wine changed over 18 months. So in other words, we were watching the amount of browning in each, each bottle um, over the 18 months. So this was 600 bottles, uh, 200 with natural cork, 200 with screw cap, and 200 with synthetic cork. And we looked at how brown each bottle changed over the course of 18 months. So this is just a sample of what the data looked like. So we had these, we had duplicate um, absorbance measurements uh, on, on five different dates. And actually, more than that, but some of them we couldn't use. And we then, from that, estimated the rate of change. In other words, we looked at the slope of the increase in, in brown color. So the data looks something like this <clears throat> for each bottle. And this actually includes the duplicate measurements. So you can see there's a, the, the, it sort of looks like a step. The yellow line looks sort of like a step function because we've got uh, duplicate measurements at each time. And then we take all this data and we put do linear regression. All right. And sometimes these lines don't, this line looks really pretty. Some of them didn't look quite so pretty, but we did linear regression to, to see how, and then that defined for each bottle, the slope of that line defines how fast the browning is occurring. Okay. So if the browning was occurring really fast, we have a high slope to the line. If it's, if there's no change, for instance, then the slope would be zero, okay? And then we looked at every single closure. So we have a bunch of data on every bottle. <clears throat> and we have, then we take the averages and we can see here that the rate of change, in other words, the rate of browning was the lowest with the natural cork, which is the green bar. And synthetic cork and screw cap were a little bit faster on average, all right? But you can see the difference isn't huge. In other words, it's not even a factor of two different, 20 or 30% different between these closures. But you also see that the error bars are different, are quite 
lar quite a bit larger with the natural quark. So here is the pre presentation of the entire data set for um, this is synthetics. <clears throat> now this is not an oxygen in you know transmission line. This is the slope of every single cork, right? So it gives you the rate of browning for every one of the 200 bottles, and you can see that the the there most of the bottles are fairly similar. And we have a few outliers at the end. Okay. And we compare our three different closure sets. Here we have the blue is synthetic and then the green is screw cap. And you can see those two lines are really close together. Both are very consistent. And at the right end, you can see the few outliers with a few closures that are have higher browning rates. If you look at the natural cork, you can see the middle of the line, the average is lower than the other two as i showed on the other graph but you can see there's a much the slope of the line is higher meaning there's more variability between uh, the synthetic or the naturals and we have a, a fairly sizable population out there on the right of bottles that are browning pretty fast okay so there is more variability substantially more variability in fact the coefficient of variation if we look at all these numbers is about 15% for the synthetic and screw caps, but the coefficient of variation is 50% on the natural quarks. I've got that data again. So the natural quarks have the lowest oxygen transfer rate on average, but much more variability. So you got here 50% versus 13 and 14%. And, and so the conclusion here is the screw caps and synthetics are very consistent. Uh, with the natural quarks having much more inconsistency than, than the manufactured uh, closures. Now, I should mention we did test, though, these, the wine we put in there was a, was a Sauvignon Blanc. And our uh, partner, a uh, winemaking partner, said that she would not want this wine on the shelf after two years, based on her experience. Um, we tasted the wine at roughly two years with a consumer panel. Now, this is different from an expert winemaker panel. They're not as sensitive and not as familiar with wine flaws. Uh, and we tested the brownest bottles from all three sets, as well as the least brown and average bottles. And what was surprising is that our consumer panel really could not pick up anything. They could not distinguish any of these wines. So. At that point, we still had small amounts of SO2 left in every bottle, even the ones that had browned the most. But it was, I think, quite important to note that the consumer panel did not detect any flaws or noticeable differences in, in this last set. So, <clears throat> um, the natural cork is the most variable. It may not be that big a deal, as I mentioned, because of the consumers aren't that sensitive to the variability. Uh, but that was the point of the experiment to see what whether consumers one of the points of the experiment was to see if consumers could pick that up. Um, but if you're concerned about consistency, then probably a manufactured closure would be the way to go. Um, uh, at, at least you have a it, we we can tell from our data that you. You definitely have more consistency with the natural closure. I mean, a synthetic closure, manufactured. Um, just to mention in closing, a few um, innovations that are out there in the market now. Um, you can get synthetic uh, closures that are made from sustainable sources. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can you can buy natural corks that have been analyzed individually for TCA and. There's a couple different services. Some are uh, human uh, testing, other are instrumental. Um, and the idea is that by paying the extra cost, which can be substantial uh, for this service, you can eliminate every chance, any chance of getting uh, having a tainted uh, bottle. Um, and that's fairly popular according to the companies that offer this service. Um, and then you can get um, liners and synthetics with selectable uh, 
oxygen ingress rates. So in a way you can dial in the closure to match the style of wine and the aging uh, profile that you're looking for. Um, so, so interesting things available in the market. Um, what else can we see, expect to see? Uh, certainly the last few years, the last 10 years, we've seen lots of innovation. I expect to see more unusual <laughs> packages. Uh, cans now are booming. Uh, kegs, well, kegs not so popular <laughs> with restaurants closed, but uh, that'll probably come back. Um, Tetra packs have, haven't made much headway, but perhaps they will. Um, uh, and just, I guess, one of the things I can tell you is that um, the variability of natural cork might be an issue, but very high end products, I can't imagine switching from natural cork. It's just part of the, of the package, part of the product is a, a reflection on tradition. Etc. And it's unlikely. I haven't seen any. Uh, well, there is one company, a high-end company in, in California, using uh, natural or using screw caps on um, a high-end wine. But very, very few companies have made that switch. Uh, not to say it can't happen. For instance, in New Zealand, almost everything is sealed under a screw cap. Uh, we actually get uh, some of their products sealed under natural cork that are. In New Zealand, sold or and, and sealed under screw cap. So things can change, but um, it looks to me like in the U.S. market, high-end products will stick with natural cork, uh, regardless of the issues. Just want to conclude here by thanking a few of the people who are involved in the project at different points: uh, Jillian, Maury, Shelley, and thank the Plumpjack Group for their support for the project, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andy. That was great presentation. And I think we'll have some question regarding the use of screw cap or corks for the cold hardy grapes, because they are very different than Vitis vinifera, and we don't have a lot of background about the type of closure to use for those grapes. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box all the chat box because nobody is asking anything <laughs> so please <laughs> well, write well, something. Well, i was going to say something uh while we're waiting for a question um the uh the uh torque testers uh for screw cap use um they are rather pricey the digital ones are up around fifteen hundred dollars i'm trying to get a quote on uh it's made by a company called Accutech, and it's an analog. It's a spring uh, 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 metered tester. Um, I have a feeling even that's going to be five or six hundred dollars or so. And the uh, uh, handy dandy uh, under cork vacuum tester, uh, the needle tester that um, Katie mentioned, uh, you can get that from D, like Drew, dwinesupplies.com. It's called a vacuum cork tester, and it's $183. Thank you for all those price. <laughs> uh, so I have one question. For us, really small wineries looking at semi-automatic corkers, can you please comment on nitrogen injection versus vacuum? Chris, I think you muted, so. Can you, can you repeat that? The <laughs> it was semi-automatic corker? With vacuum yep. and yeah, so can you comment on either the use of nitrogen or the vacuum? Uh, well, they're they're both good if you can do both. Uh, the 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 reason for nitrogen typically most people that bottle with cork don't do a nitrogen drip. They use usually that's only done under screw cap application because of that headspace. When you, if you remember where Katie had uh, shown the picture of a cork and the screw cap, there's more headspace. So Usually that's done in a screw cap application where they do a nitrogen drip. Typically the new filling lines and, and bottling lines, they um, the newer ones purge the bottle with nitrogen as it's being filled. So as the wine's going in just before that, the inner nitrogen 
is purging in the bottle and displacing the oxygen. So removing that oxygen as it's filling. And then the vacuum is really there to create a, a suction to pull a little bit of oxygen, but create a suction before that cork's compressed and inserted into the bottle. So typically you don't see people doing nitrogen injection on in cork insertion. Now, I can't speak to synthetics because I haven't used a lot of synthetics, and uh, but I know on natural cork or micros or one plus ones, the, the aglo body corks, um, I'm not aware of anybody actually doing a nitrogen drip, but it is, it is from a quality standpoint, uh, if you can do it with screw caps, it's important. And we see that a lot in applications of screw caps. So Chris, can you, so for the, um, probably for someone with a semi-automatic corker, where they can't have a vacuum option, would they still want to be doing, would they, even under cork, would they still want to use uh, nitrogen? Um, no, I don't, I, mean, I don't see people on the West Coast. I can only speak for the West Coast, but I don't see people doing that. I don't see any nitrogen. It's um, the, the thing is, if you have a semi-automatic corker, um, you're, you almost have to, if you're not pulling vacuum, you have to compensate for your eulage and your temperature and volume. So, you know, when you do cork them, you want to leave those upside right for a period of time, three to four months, just to make sure that everything settles with the cork and you create a seal. Because one, one of the things with paraffin and silicone when we coat the corks is that that paraffin actually acts like a sealer to the sidewalls of the bottle. So once it's compressed and then it comes back out, it actually adds a, um, a seal to to lock to the bottle. And um, if you if you look at a lot of white wines that are produced with natural cork or micros or, or one plus ones that have paraffin and, and silicone coating, when you extract those corks out, a lot of times you can see in the neck of the bottle, the paraffin uh, line on, on the inside of the bottle. So just a little trick to see, but most people that I know of that are using semi-automatic corkers are not using, uh, if they're not using a vacuum, they're not using a drip. So. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, Drew, I don't know if you want to ask the question I just sent you, or uh, if you want me to ask it. Oh, I I don't see it. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm gonna ask. Back. Go ahead. So for a young winemaker in a small production winery filling their wine in a mobile mo bottling line, what type of closure would you suggest to ensure minimal problems? Anyone? Well, I'll, 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 I'll jump in because uh, it wasn't too long ago I was a, still a commercial winemaker uh screw caps uh do actually two things uh, and i'm going to stop my video uh, screw caps uh both close the bottle and they finish the bottle so they they act they close the bottle like a cork and they also act like a capsule so and and still i think a screw cap is only about 12 or 13 cents uh, chris or katie can can correct me if i'm wrong uh so in terms of just expense and as dr waterhouse points out increased consistency uh, if you're not expecting to keep your wines on the market for five or ten years if you if you're going to if they're going to get out the door in a year or two uh, uh screw caps do a, do a fine job and will maybe save you a little money um when you use a cork uh there are corks you can get for 12 or 13 cents uh but you also going to have to pay gosh what does a capsule now cost uh 16 cents 18 cents a piece so there is just the the uh, the issue of price right i think that that's a big factor that we see in a lot of the business we do for those folks that you know you're right absolutely right a, a screw cap seals it and it's and it's like a capsule at the same time so you have one thing to deal with as far as ordering and cost um you can use a natural cork but those wines that are moving quickly in the market you know year or two or three years you know we love to sell everybody natural cork, but we also know there's a reality, a cost factor. And so, you know, using a micro, you know, which is a, a, a cheaper alternative or a one plus ones that you can get cheaper than a, a screw cap, a stock screw cap, at, like we talked about at, you know, uh, 13 cents. And then you're looking at a poly lamb capsule, which would run you a point, you know, a half a penny or or, or maybe, maybe five cents per, 
per cap. So you can get there on cost and have a different look as well, a different appearance. So it, it, we find a lot of customers are more concerned with obviously the closure, but the appearance too, what, what they're selling in the market. So do they want to have a micro aglo cork and a capsule or do they just want a screw cap? And screw caps, you can get them decorated now, you know, to, to look very nice. So a um, little more expensive, but they look nice and, and easy application, you know, and for the customer as well. So. Uh, so would you suggest to use like screw caps to avoid to have too much oxidation into your wine? If you don't have, let's say for cold hardy grapes, we don't, we don't have a lot of tannins. So they tend to be really easily oxidized wine. So would you suggest to use screw caps rather than corks? Or not really? That, I, I, would leave, I would leave that one to Katie because she's more familiar <laughs> with that. But I mean, I'm not familiar with that wine, but I would, I mean, if I was to suggest, yes, I would say a screw cap. Uh, would probably be your best option, but Katie's more of a winemaker yeah. than I am. I think I think the most important is controlling that oxygen level going into the bottle um, to make sure that you're not oxidizing any of the any of the flavors to begin with. Um, is probably more important than the closure, but the screw cap. I mean, you can if you want to keep that fresh and fruity flavor, and you're wanting to sell it in under five years. A screw cap is great, or like the micro aglo corks are actually there's less of that um how we how we said that oxygen diffusion with the micro aglos because they're not as spongy, so you don't get that sponge um, effect of squeezing and getting a lot of that air in right away. So that would also be a really good choice. But really, you can use any closure as long as you're controlling your oxygen and your SO2 up front on the wines, um, like anything. Yeah, good point. Yeah. We we always talk about oxygen. DEO in the tank to the bottling line. And we talk and look at closures, new, you know, a bunch of studies, and we, we see the OTR and the change in wine, but really the biggest impact is from a bottling perspective is what's the DO in the tank and what's the DO, what's the pickup at the filler bowl, because that can have a bigger impact on your wine and aging than a closure that only imparts, you know, very small amounts of oxygen. So that key part of the front is really important to make sure that when you've made your wine, you want to finish it off with, you know, you spent all that time making a great wine. You don't want to, you don't want to, uh, you know, hurt it any further. So, but yeah, micros are a good option too. Well, let me, let me, really... let me, oh, yeah, cool. let me jump in here. Uh, yep. it, it is, it really is true that the amount of oxygen encountered during bottling can have a big impact. Um, in fact, there was a study showing that even now this was with Riesling. I don't know how many folks are growing Riesling over there, but with the Riesling wine, they looked at one milligram versus five milligrams of oxygen at bottling. I granted, so that's you know a good bottling system versus a poorly maintained one. But at six months, they could still taste a significant difference in those those two wines, which. I found rather shocking that that you know that a little bit of sloppiness at bottling actually affected the quality of the wine at six months. So now that Riesling is particularly sensitive, um, uh, but uh, it it really does point out how how important that oxygen pickup is during the bottling process. It really can have lasting effects on the wine. Yeah, that's a great point. We we see that too in. Uh... With, in vacuum fillers, if a valve sticks and the vacuum's pulling, you know, it's just sucking the outside air up through that valve into the bowl, you know, just adding huge amounts of oxygen to it. We've also seen there, I haven't seen any studies, but we hear from customers that bottle with micros that have certain uh, consistent OTR rates uh, that they have um, variations in their wine and they try and figure out well, why is that the OTR rate should be consistent for that closure and they're right but when you stop and start your bottling line throughout the day and you take a break and maybe you don't run it out and leave bottles on the line those are sitting and picking up oxygen so then when you go to cork them with a consistent closure whether it's screw cap synthetics or micros you're 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 corking and closing that wine off and sitting there so the OTR rates are going to be higher so you know, if your bottling line runs perfect at 98% efficiency every day, 
you're probably good. You're not going to see much variation, but if you're stopping and starting, things are picking up oxygen. So you're closing it with a consistent closure. So your variation is, and so we, we've heard that from customers as well. So um, a lot of things to take into account when choosing so a closure. SO2 is key, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then, you know, if you wanted to get a, if you're measuring your SO2, you should have a pH meter to make sure that you're you're adding it correctly. And if you have a pH meter, then it's easy to get a DO, a dissolved oxygen probe to add to that. Um, so most are, there's a lot of pH meters on the market that can act as either a DO meter or a pH meter. Um, and so then just measuring your dissolved oxygen kind of throughout the winemaking process too from you know, finishing through bottling. Yep. And so there is one question comment um, regarding the use of vacuum or nitrogen. If you don't use vacuum or nitrogen, we have to add a little bit more SO2, right? I would say yes. Yes. And in theory, if you fill the ulate space with nitrogen, then there is no need to add more SO2. In organic wine production, sometimes it's very important step because with more than 10 milligrams per liter, one can exceed the European Union regulation. That's an example. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Especially if you're exporting wine. Yeah. 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 I think. Yeah. I think they answered their own question. I don't know yes. what the question is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think if, if you are going for a low sulfur wine, um, you have to be extremely careful about oxygen pickup. So even so you'd have to do that nitrogen sparging and you know anyone doing no sulfur wine has to worry about that. And so you have to be even more technical at your bottling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's many ways to, to uh, alleviate oxygen pickup. I mean, there's systems out there where they have nitrogen injection into the tank your bottling from so it blankets the tank as the wine comes down and goes to your bottling line you know your usage of nitrogen goes up so the costs go up but there's there's several different ways of qc to, to protect that wine but um, going back to just checking your do in the tank and your and your oxygen your do at the filler bowl is is very important uh, mm -hmm. from a bottling perspective yeah uh, Andy, did you respond to one question in, like, in the Q&A, or did you just made a comment? <laughs> Me? Oh, I, I was just, I was just making no, a comment. No, Andy. Yeah, oh, Andy, Andy, oh. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm seeing some Q&A questions on my screen here that you're not talking about, so I'm trying to answer them by text, by typing. I, was I supposed okay. to? Okay. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> I, and you're mentioning questions I don't see, so I don't know how this works. I'm not that familiar with this uh, WebEx format. Okay, so I'm just going to read the question just to make sure everyone can know the question. Uh, so regarding sulfite addition prior to bottling, does the timing of the addition matter when it's added? My concern mainly being adding powder of sulfite solution and not giving enough uh, giving enough time to dissolve or diffuse through the wine prior to bottling. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. So, oh, I saw I saw that you answered, but um, a few hours. But we've actually found that if you add a lot of sulfur within with more than six within six hours of bottling, that it can actually shrink. The yeast cells. So there's some studies showing that that you shrink the yeast by doing it too close to bottling, where some of the cells will get through your membrane, your sterile membrane, um, and then can reinfect the bottle. So it's usually, you know, more than six hours prior to bottling is when you want to make sure that your sulfur is is added. Okay. okay. I'd, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, and the, it, it, I was going to say, in, in other words. Adjust your sulfur, let's say, the night before uh, you start right. bottling. 12-hour okay. <laughs> rule, right? 12-hour rule. Yeah. 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 Uh, the next question was, is actually the natural cork stopper going to stop completely the oxygen intake after time from bottling? 
And Andy, you responded. <laughs> yeah, so no, it does not. Um, really, no, no closures completely stop oxygen intake. The only one that really reduces it is the serotonin. Um, you know, that has a very, very low rate. Um, however, we have noticed that um, the rate of oxygen that comes through a natural cork really decreases with time. So this would explain, for instance, why you can actually have wine that's drinkable after 25 years. And the reason is that, you know, in the first year, maybe you'll get one milligram of oxygen through the cork, but in the 10th year, you're getting much less. And that the number stays very small, presumably up until the point where the cork starts to fail, right? So when the cork is 30, 40 years old, then, you know, it, it's the elast elasticity or whatever that term is, it doesn't seal properly on the bottle and you start getting a failure. Um, so, yeah, it, it does, it does change. It reduces with time, but doesn't go to zero. Good answer. Yep. Okay, we have more questions. Uh, what would be a good deal reading for your wine prior to bottling and after? Winemakers? <laughs> um, I, it's been so long, I can't remember what the good readings are or what you would want for DO. It would be something I have to look at for it. I think the most important is that you want it to be consistent throughout bottling. Yeah, if you're at two at the tank, you want to be as close to two as you can at the filler bowl. But I, I think it's, I'm just going to go out on a limb. I, I think you want to be below uh, two, right? I mean, that's, um, that was some, and, yeah, off the top of my head, that's what I was thinking as well, but I couldn't remember if, if that. I know for dissolved CO2, you want to be below like 800 for CO2. And corks push at 1300, but I can't remember for oxygen. But two sounds like the right number, but I haven't done it in a while. At, at, uh, at Bridalwood, which is a, a gallo shop, uh, the goal was to get it to one. Uh, yeah. And if we, if we could get it to a 1.2, we thought we were pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I would say. I mean, you want, I mean, the target should be one. Um, and, you know, the closer you can get to that, the better. Um, <laughs> if, if you're at four or five, you've got a problem. Yeah. You're going you're to have a big problem. So, yeah. so yeah, shoot, shoot for one, maybe, and depends on your technology and, you know, how, what you can do, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and if you're 1.2, 1.4 or something at the, at the tank and you go to your filler and you're checking your DO there and it's, now increase to 2.7, then you know you have oxygen coming in from somewhere. Is it a stuck valve? Is it a, is it a, a, a on the, maybe the filler bowl has a leak on a seal where it's sucking in air? So that's that's immediate cause to shut down and try and find that right away. Um, Thank you. Um, no, we don't have more question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a I have a question for Andrew. I, I thought that study on the white wine, the Sauvignon Blanc. I'm glad you mentioned that it was Sauvignon Blanc because what we see is white wines tend to brown. Uh, and I'm not a winemaker, so Katie, jump in here and and correct me if I'm wrong. But we we see white wines obviously brown, and Drew the same thing. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but white wines tend to brown faster. And I don't know if that's because there's less SO2 in it, but red wines that I would really be interested to see on a red wine study, if you could somehow, it's hard because you can't really see the browning like you can in a Flint bottle like the Cell Blanc, but it'd be really kind of, it'd be neat to see because, you know, white wines aren't made, I mean, most white wines are not made to be in the market forever and you're not laying them down forever. Whereas, you know, reds, there's a majority of reds that are made to drink now and there's still a lot of, you know, especially the wineries in Napa and Sonoma and these other areas and and Paso and, and Washington, they're, they're making wines to lay down again. And so it, I, I think it'd be kind of interesting to do a study like that if there was a way to see it. And I don't know how you do that with a spectrometer or what, but it'd be kind of interesting to see if there's a, a difference between the two. I don't know if there would be. You just don't see it in red wines because it's red and it's dark, you know, easier to see in white. But. 
I think you could do it. I mean, odd that would be something to do with the cold hardy grapes because that's what I think that what's harder in red is that they have the tannins. Um, so that's a natural right. antioxidant. Um, but even but for the, the red, you can still see a little bit of browning. Yeah, that's yeah. not exactly the same color, but still you have the brick, orange. Yeah, those, the spectrophotometers are sensitive enough where they should be able to see a slight color change. Yeah, like I've opened up burgundies or had a nice old bottle of wine that's 25, 30 years old. And yes, it looks brownish. It's not as vibrant red as it was coming off the press, but you know, it, it still tastes nice, but you know, it, you know, that's a 25, 30 year wine, you know, uh, be curious to see that in a 10, 15, 20 year red. Be interesting to see. Well, we, we, we have a long-term experiment um, where we're, we're going to try to be where we'll be measuring these things. One of the problems uh, generally is that postdocs and grad students don't last long enough to get the data. <laughs> they want to get that. So, you're saying, <laughs> so yeah. you're saying it's you, me, and Katie, and Drew, huh? It's it's <laughs> we'll, we'll be we'll be here with you. But but yeah, like Ode said, I mean, the, we know that red wines do brown. Um, and especially if you look at really old ones. In fact, um, we have a we have a wine that I made with some friends a few years ago, and it sort of lost track of the a couple of cases in the back of a closet, and pulled them out and poured some, and are like, like we didn't even have to taste it. <laughs> <laughs> we could see that it was uh, kind of brown. If you want a few bottles, I'll be glad to ship them to you. <laughs> anyway, Great Christmas. Christmas. So it was a it was a lighter red, and it definitely turned brown with time. So yeah, it does happen for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's no question that uh, color is a color retention is a matrix of issues. The the amount of anthocyanins in the beginning, the pH, the uh, dissolved oxygen. The amount of free sulfur at bottling, all of those things play together uh, to to affect color in the long term. No question about it. Yeah. It's been fascinating to just experience that as a a winemaker and a wine drinker all these years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I don't see any more question. I saw one question about wax sealing with waxes. Um, oh, okay. Go ahead. I, I don't have any information about sealing the wax. I, I think it I, would be the same because the cork is going to be your main seal. I think then the, the wax over the top isn't going to be any no. different for that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Typically, you see the wax cracks on top anyways at some point in time, right? So yeah. it, it may give a short term, but uh, eventually it'll crack. Do you see my I say, screen? I say, sorry, I'm sorry. If can we see the, screen? Yeah, you can see the screen. Uh, I'm just going to say, if that question about wax is just about its use in general, uh, not whether it actually seals a bottle, but if you just have questions about using wax as a decorative element, uh, uh, email me. Uh, Ode is going to put uh, uh, our contact info up. I've got a lot of experience wax dipping and a lot of neat tips and advice about it. Yep. Uh, so I just wanted to finish to um, on this webinar series to say thank you to all of you for being the great presenters today for our last webinar of the series. Thank you for all the attendees for attending our webinar series. Feel free to uh, ask any question to either Drew or myself or Andy or Chris or Katie. Um, just send an email. Uh, also, remember to take the survey that you should receive in a few minutes uh, by email. So that's going to take only two to five minutes. So please <laughs> give us your feedback. And on that, I just wish you a happy holidays, a happy next year, like New Year. Hopefully, that will be better than 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 2021's got it has to be better, right? Yes. Yeah. We can only go up from here. <laughs> All right. Thank Thanks. you, Odd. Thank you, Drew. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Katie, for helping Pleasure. us out again. Great to see yeah. you all. Safe.
Yep. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Yeah. Bye.